Hey everybody, thanks for hanging out with me on this eight minute mind shift. This is number four. So uh, thank you for being here. John chapter three, Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, you know, what's going on? Who are you? Kind of questioned him. And Jesus said something really interesting. He said, unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. For the sake of our moment here, let's just think of the kingdom of God as the activity of God in the earth today. So Jesus said, unless you're born again, unless you have this experience of rebirth with me, you can't see what God's doing in the earth. Then he said, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom. So then he said, unless you have this experience of being born again, you can't enter into the activity of God in the earth today. I don't know about you guys, but man, who wouldn't want to see the activity of God and then who wouldn't want to get in on it? So I, you know, that's the kind of stuff that excites me. I believe the new birth is a phenomenally, absolutely necessary, important thing. But I think we, we've, we've sold it incorrectly. We've presented it in a very limited way. Um, we we kind of have this attitude that, well, you know, oh, oh, have you accepted Jesus? Oh, great. And it's like we go, ah. No, yes, it's a really important step that you've accepted Jesus, but it's only a beginning. Remember back in our first week together, we talked about the be, the, the whole eight, eight at 808 and all that, and eight means new beginnings. Well, I said some of this stuff. The act of entering a beginning is the act of entering a process. When you get born again, you're, you've entered a process. It's a threshold between what was and what could be. It's the point of time when my future stops repeating my past. How many of you would like your future to not be a repetition of your past? All of that is possible. Another thing we said was this, to get where you need to go, you've got to accept where you are. Look around and say, you know, this is working, this isn't, this is doing well, this is broken, whatever. Accept where you are, but refuse to stay there. Accept where you are, but refuse to stay there. And so in John chapter 3, we see this beautiful example of the new birth. But here's the deal, guys. It's the beginning of a race, not the finish. Now, the cool thing is we start the race at the finish line, but there's another finish line. Meaning that we start the race uh, accepted and approved and loved and, and cared for by God. But it's not the end of the race. And I'll do anything I can, any way I can, to poke you and prod you and provoke you. That there's a, there's a life waiting for you. I remember when I was reading years ago about, you know, when the new age was coming on the scene. And I remember the one thing that stuck with me more than anything else was a guy who had kind of a more of a gracious perspective of the of the new age movement and here's what he said all the new age is is a bunch of people that don't know what we know out from the bible that are simply saying out of their heart there's more in other words what they were saying was there's got to be more to life than what we're seeing and experiencing and i believe we found the key to that in john chapter 10 verse 10 we talked about this. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life and that life more abundantly. The New Age movement said there's more. Jesus said there's more. And here's the thing. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you might have more life. Here's the deal. Both of them require our cooperation. If I'm gonna, uh, if the devil's gonna steal from me, if he's gonna kill and destroy, I gotta, I gotta help him. I gotta participate. I gotta, I gotta move in the directions he moves me. I've gotta do the things he leads me to do. I, I've got to help him. Well, here's the deal with Jesus. I've come, Jesus. I've come that you might have life, a different kind of life than you've ever had before, and more life than you can wrap your hands around. But he needs your cooperation. He needs you to say yes to things he, that he, he brings up. He needs you to be open to his perspective on things. He needs you to get into scripture. He needs you to allow him to start at the finish line of the new birth. You got to start there. Everybody starts there in Christianity. But from there, uh, there's so much more. There's so much more. Um, I, I love this simple prayer. It's a prayer I've just stumbled onto recently, and I love it. I don't want 
anything. We talked last week about defining what you want. I don't want anything God doesn't want me to have. But I want everything God wants me to have. I'm going to say it one more time. I don't want anything that God doesn't want me to have. But I want everything God wants me to have. Now, if I have any hope or expectation for that to be true in my life, I'm going to have to cooperate. I'm going to have to recognize that Jesus saved me, the new birth, but he's continuing to work in me and continuing to bring me to uh, 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 realizations, awareness, and then the resources that are available around me through Scripture, the Spirit, the people he puts in my life, etc. Here's a couple of verses for you to think about. John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus said to those Jews who believed, if you continue my word, pretty good statement, then you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Just a few verses later, that's verse 31, 32. And verse 36, scripture says this, he whom the son sets free is free indeed. Now, obviously, both of those scriptures would seem to indicate that we're not currently free or we don't start in a posture of freedom. But it says that if we'll know the truth, if we'll continue in his word, we can then know the truth and that truth will set us free. And then, of course, later it says, if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. So here's my question, and this is a question that drives me, perplexes me. Why, with scriptures like that and others, why are real freedom and lasting change so rare? Why are there so many Christians who have passed through John 3, who are born again, who've prayed the sinner's prayer, who have seen the kingdom, and at least legally, whether experientially or not, it's another question, they've entered the kingdom. Why are they not, we not, experiencing this abundant life? Again, I'm going to throw some stuff at you. Take these scriptures down, chew on them, think about them. And this is the stuff we're going to push on every week we meet. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart. How we think determines how we are. How we think determines how we are. Romans 12, 2, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, be, you're going to be changed by God getting into your thoughts what, you, what you've come to know and believe and, and challenging them and changing them. Ephesians 4 says this, put off the old man and all that was involved with him. That's 22. 24 says, put on the new man who's created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. In other words, put on this new man that, that was born again, but in the middle, put off old man, put on new man. In the middle, verse 23 says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What am I trying to say to you? God has a great life for you. God has a great plan for you. The greatest obstacles, the greatest barriers, the greatest opposition between you and the life God has for you, the greatest obstacles are inside of you. I would probably go so far as to say they're between your ears. What we're going to talk a lot about, in fact, that's why we named this the eight-minute mind shift. Slowly but surely, God wants to identify, challenge, and change destructive patterns of thought, belief, and behavior. And by the grace of God, we're going to walk together and figure out how to do that. Love you guys. See you next time.